All right. So what we're looking at here is just a basic trial accounts Power Options. Uh, for those of you that are just getting started using Power Options, I encourage you to use the four steps that are outlined here. You want to make sure that you take advantage of the uh, free quick start guide to show you how to start using the tools. There's a variety of Flash tutorials that will help you get more familiar with the tools and some of the strategies. We do host a variety of free webinars during the week. And at any time, you can also access our full archive. I'll usually point to that once or twice during the presentation today. And then, of course, those of you that are trial members or subscribers can schedule a free coaching session at any time. And that's essentially a 35 to 45 minute phone conversation with myself or Ernie. We will walk you through the tools on the site and answer any questions that you have. All right, so real quick here, looks like our first question has come from, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> Patrick. And Patrick asks, I want to hold a stock for the long run in general. Uh, since most pay a dividend and I'm retired, I am more aggressive as a rule of thumb when I sell out of the money options. Well, um, we'll get to that in just a moment as well. Okay, but said so when I start each day, what should I be looking for to evaluate my covered calls and married puts for rolling them? Okay. Well, the first thing that I want to mention, uh, Patrick, is that in general, let's just pull up a chain here for, you know, we'll use Apple because everyone's familiar with Apple. I want to use a smaller stock, actually. I'm going to use AEIS. Okay, it's a stock that I'm in right now. I actually just made an adjustment on my Mary put today. Probably going to do one in a little bit. And I just want to go to the option chain. We're just going to look at the call chain for May. Okay, so coming up. So if I was looking at a covered call position for AEIS, the reason I chose this, because there's really only two choices that are available on this particular stock, AEIS right now is trading at 68.50. Okay, so if I bought the stock today at 68.50, I'd probably be looking to sell the 70 strike call for about $2. Now this would give me a downside protection of about almost 3%, meaning the stock could fall 3% before I start losing money on the position. And my return if assigned would be 5.2%. This would be the at the money covered call. It's considered moderate. Now, if I go deeper in the money to the 65 strike, I'm going to collect more premium. So let's say we get about $5 for the 65 strike. Well, if I receive $5 and the stock's at 68.50, that means my time premium is only $1.50. Okay? The rest of the $5, of course, um, premium that I receive, we're giving up to intrinsic value. But why would I do that? The reason why is because I'm going to get close to about a 7% downside protection. I mean, the stock can fall 7% before I'm losing money on the position. And I still can make about a 2% return in 28 days. Okay, so this isn't a bad trade. This would be considered more conservative at the money is moderate. Now, Patrick says as he focuses on his out of the money calls, he might be looking at the 75 strike, maybe getting about 70 cents. So he only has about a 1% downside protection and a potential return if assigned. If the stock went above 75, he'd gain an additional 650 from where he purchased the stock today, plus that extra 70 cents premium. So he'd make 720, he'd be at about a 10.3% return. Now, in most cases, if you're doing a covered call from scratch and you're going out of the money because your focus is on this high return of 10%, but in reality, you only have a 20%, 30% probability of getting assigned and earning that return. All right, so that would be considered aggressive. Why am I going through all this? Is because if your plan is to hold the stock long term to receive the dividend, and you're neutral to bullish on the stock, meaning you even if it falls or the market pulls back, you don't expect to lose more than 3% or so, I wouldn't necessarily call the out of the money in that case aggressive. That's what you want to do if you're holding a stock long term, okay? You don't get as much downside protection, but you're not really focused on this return either. You're trying to receive a dividend-like income on a month-by-month -month basis, hoping this expires worthless, stays below 75, you keep the premium and hold the stock. What I'm getting at is this would be considered an aggressive covered call for someone who's just opening a trade, isn't married to the stock, 
and is hoping to get assigned at 75, focusing on this part here, the 10.3% return, but not paying attention to the fact they only have a 1% downside protection. That's where a lot of covered call traders who are just trading, hoping to get assigned month by month, and just continue to open new positions after assignment, get into trouble because they use the aggressive out of the money approach, which offers a high percent return, but only 20 or 30% of those are gonna be assigned and ever get close to that return. The rest of them, you might actually have a loss in the first month because it might drop more than 1%, you didn't cover the downside. Okay, so I just wanted to cover that. Inside every strategy, you could consider, for example, in a covered call, there are ways to do it conservatively, moderately, and aggressive. But for the dividend approach, Patrick, and long-term holding, I don't consider out of the money as an aggressive covered call approach. What you're trying to do is generate a dividend-like income in addition to the dividend for your longer-term holdings. But when you say, let's get to your real meat of your question here, when I start each day, what should I be looking at to evaluate my covered calls? Okay, so what I do is I go to the Power Options portfolio. It's the first place I go in the morning. And what I focus on first is, I know most of my positions already, but what I'm focusing on first is the change today and the current price. Okay, so let's see, this position is reversed from the other week. Uh, oh, this isn't what I want, I'm sorry, give me one second here. I need to go to this one here. Sorry about that. All right, Patrick, here we go. So what I'm looking at when I first open my portfolio now, I've looked at it the day before, too. So I see this here is down 19%, but what I'm looking at is the change today. Okay, so I see Ubiquity Networks is down 59 cents. I've actually rolled this put down to the 55 previously, and I just had the 55 call expire worthless on this stock uh, today. Okay, but here's an important one. You know, ah, it's not shown. I haven't updated this in a while. But... This one here on AEIS, I'm holding the 60 call. Today was actually the 65. And the stock's trading at 68.50, and it was down 43 cents. So I knew I was gonna have to look to roll this position at that time, okay? And, or just close it. And in this case, I just closed it. Actually, let me do something here real quick. So what I wanna know is what is the stock move today? Sometimes you'll see large movements on a position if they had earnings the night before or if there's an unexpected move in the stock when you first got up. That's what I want to see. I check it at about 9.40 in the morning to see what is available. Based on what I have as far as a covered call or a married put, what would that be? I'm actually going to switch gears here real quick. I'm going to go back to where we were in a moment. We're going to go to portfolios here. All right. And let's go to AEIS. Okay, so the position I had on AEIS today didn't really look like this, but originally what I had done is I had sold the April 65 call for a premium of 160. And I gotta drop this down to 61.99. Okay, so here was the current position I was in. I had a maximum risk of 1.4% and a return of 4.3%. Now, if you notice, if I go back to the portfolio, you see that some of these areas here, let me go to the standard view, but you see that I have a couple of positions where this third column here, the alerts column, is showing a trigger. So this one has highlighted, the one on eBay has highlighted as well, okay? And it's because I set an alert on the stock. So for the AEIS position, I changed this, but I had originally set the upper stop limit on the stock at 65.40. So when that was triggered is when I would want to look to make an adjustment on the 65 call. Now, because I actually received $1.60, I had set this at 67. Uh, 40 for the roll in the position and it of course went up to 68.50 in the past two days. Why didn't I roll it at 67.40 originally instead of waiting today to close it? Well, let me show you. I'll admit the stock sort of handcuffed me. Let's go to big charts and let's just go to a one month chart for AEIS. 
So we had sold that 65 strike back in uh, March. I'm sorry, back around March 21st or so, or March, March 18th, March 19th, after March expiration. That's when we had sold the 65 call. Of course, you see on the 21st, the stock sort of came back down. It was in our range of 65 to 66 and suddenly shot up. Well, then it pulled back. And so a few days ago, right on the 17th and the 18th, the stock was right around 65. It had dropped below 65 on the 17th. Now, when it did this on the 17th, I figured we're only five days away for expiration. I didn't want to pay the $4 or $5 to buy it back at this point. I could have bought it back for about 80 cents at this point after receiving $1.60, but I figured this was the trend and it was going to stable and be 65.50, so I was going to be very happy only paying 50, 60 cents for it. Well, you see what happened. It jumped up to 68 the next day and closed at 67, so I figured, okay, it's right at about my stop now at 67.40, so I was probably going to close it the next day, but it gapped up to 69. Well, I didn't want to pay another 420, 450 to buy it back on Thursday, or I'm sorry, on Wednesday. And then, of course, we went down here to the 68 level. I'm sorry, on Thursday, and then it went back. It didn't pull back as much as I was hoping back in the 67 level. So I had to pay to close it today. But I got trapped. Right, My stop was at 67.40. It sort of hit it here, but it settled down, and I was hoping it was going to come back down, but it didn't. It shot back up, so I had to pay more for it than I originally expected. It caught me off guard. I could have closed it for a gain, this call, but instead I bought it back. Now, at the time, as you probably saw, well, I had to pay 340, 350 to buy it back. Okay, so let's add that back in. So now I'm going to increase my cost basis, as you saw. I've now got, instead of the 4.3% at risk, I've got a 6.4%. And why wouldn't I have just sold now the May 70 call and rolled it up a strike? Common approach to a covered call. And I would have gotten a decent premium of about $2 for doing that. So let's add that in. Would have kept my risk at about 5%, or 37 3.8, and a potential return at expiration, of course, and that would have been at... May expiration of 3.7. Now the reason why I didn't just roll to the 70 call right now is because I have earnings coming up between on, on May 2nd. So I don't want to have a short call in place with earnings coming up in case there's a big jump on the stock. I'm going to set up the trade differently next week based on what I want to see. Okay. So where I'm going with this Patrick, is the first thing that I check is on the portfolio itself, okay? That's what I want to look at. And I know my positions. I knew I had the 65 put here, which I might roll up. Why haven't I rolled it up yet? Because I'm looking for a little bit better price. Now that the put is out of the money, I'm going to probably roll up to the 70 to lower that risk that went up to 6.4, probably back down to about only 2%. Okay, um, So that's when I look to roll is based on this. Now, of course, what helps is setting the alerts. When I'm sitting on a position, here's the 6540 for this position. I'm going to change my alert on AEIS to be at 69. That's when I think I'm going to roll that put. If it reaches 69 on Monday or Tuesday, I'm going to roll it up in anticipation of the earnings. Okay, but if I had sold a call, let's say I had sold the 65 call, I'm probably going to set the alert at maybe 64.80 in that case on the lower side. So let's say I had sold your out of the money that call 65 strike when the stock was at 63.80. Well, I might use 64.80 just a little bit below my 65 strike as a trigger point to roll the call up to stay out of the money. Okay. Okay, and I just want to clarify this again in case I didn't. Um, Patrick had a follow-up question, um, and he had mentioned that my apparent confusion by suggesting the OTM is aggressive is that you often speak OTM as being aggressive on the webinars on OTM and ITM options. You're right. 
But what I'm talking about in that case, Patrick, of course, is the fact that if, I, if you're a covered calls trader, okay, and what you're looking to do is trade covered calls for monthly income generation, meaning that you're not really married to the stock, you just want the best return. Well, if someone says to me, Mike, how can I create a search for options that are two weeks out? Covered calls that are two weeks out and offer at least a 7% return. Well, I know right away that anything that's 14 days out and is offering a 7% return is either highly volatile or deep out of the money. Okay, so let's go 10 to 18 days out in time and a minimum 7% return if assigned. And I'm not going to put in anything for in the money or out of the money. I'm just going to look at option volume today greater than zero, open interest greater than zero. And I'm going to cut it down to stocks only between $20 and $80 per share. Actually, I'm going to go down to 10 Okay, and real quick, I just want just to narrow down the list some more, I want stocks that are in an uptrend. Okay, so this is two weeks out, covered call returns, minimum 7%. Sorry, one last thing, I'm going to exclude indexes and ETFs because I'm going to be inundated with two and three times ETFs. I don't want that for this example. I just want some standard stocks to come up. So I'm going to take out the indexes and ETFs. Don't want to see the two and three times as well. All right. Okay, so Herbalife, 59.98, the 5th of May, 75, sorry, one more thing, I apologize, option bid price greater than 25 cents. Okay, so, there we go. All right, stock I've never seen before, DATA, Tableau Software, 54.09, May 65, strike at 40 cents. The percent if, assigned is, the percent if assigned is 21%, okay? This is extremely aggressive. The person who is doing this is trying to trade covered calls to get assigned, earn the return, and they're thinking they're going to get this return, this 10% return, every 14 days. That's what I consider aggressive you have little or no probability of getting that return on the position. The stock needs to move up so there's a low probability and you didn't give yourself much downside protection. Now, I know that's confusing that I say that in all the webinars, but I'm talking about an investor who's just looking to open eight or nine covered calls, hoping to get assigned on all of them, take the profit, open eight or nine positions for the next two week series, and so on and so forth. This would be considered aggressive. Conservative would be going in the money, settling for a 1% or 2% return for 14 days, and having a 5 or 7% downside protection, reversing the two columns, essentially. But for someone who's holding long-term and doing collars or married puts to protect the stock, or even if you're just holding a strong dividend-paying stock that pays maybe a 6 or 7% dividend, and at the same time, you want to enhance the dividend, well, it doesn't do you any good to sell an in-the-money call. It doesn't do you any good to do the at-the-money call, even though it offers the best time premium, because you've got a 50-50 shot of being assigned and having to pay back in. So if you're just holding the dividend stocks, you're going long-term, the out-of-the-money is probably where you want to be, as long as you're receiving a decent enough premium, you know, 30, 20 uh, cents or so as well. Okay? All right. Okay, and I'll explain that in a moment. And so that, that, Patrick, is what I'm talking about. When you're talking about doing it on a dividend paying stock, I don't consider this aggressive because you're just looking to enhance the dividend and hold for long term. You don't want to be assigned. Whereas the investor who's doing this to be assigned but is looking out of the money for the higher return, that's aggressive because by definition, you don't have a lot of protection. All right? But first thing I do, when I log on to Power Options at about 9.35, 9.40 in the morning, is I go into portfolios and I look at the current price today and the change today. And of course, I know where my 65 put is, but I would have put an alert for when I would have rolled the positions. Uh, Mondelez, for example, um, you know, this is a new one. It's only 30 days old or so. We got in at 44.66, received the dividends, so it's lowered the price. 
but I know I'm holding the 47 put. So I'm not probably going to try anything until the stock gets up to about 46.50. So I'm looking at, the first thing I look at is this price and the change today on this particular stock. If it was down to 43 or 42.50, then I might be considering rolling this put down to take advantage of the increase in the put price to lower my cost basis, but still leave the insurance in place. Now this one in particular, I don't feel any pressure to make an adjustment because earnings are coming up in 11 days. So I don't feel the need to sell a call right now. I don't feel the need to try to do an elaborate spread on this position as an adjustment because I'm going to wait before earnings, see if I want to add extra downside protection in case I'm wrong and the stock collapses, maybe falls 8 or 9%, unlikely, but I might protect the downside further than just the put by adding an additional put or doing a combination as I did on eBay recently uh, the other day in preparation for earnings as well, which worked out extremely well. Um, for what it was. Okay, so that's how I look to roll the positions, and I'm going to use the alerts function on the portfolio. So if I opened a new covered call, let's say on AEIS I did roll to the May 70, then what I would do again is I'd go into the alerts and I'd reset them, and I'd set my upper limit on Mondelez probably at about 7050 or so. Oops. <laughs> 7050, and be a warning that I'm now in the money. So we save that and reset it. And so now my upper stop limit is set. So that also helps me if I see this gap up on Monday to 7050, if I had rolled to the May 70 call, then I may have to consider adjusting the position. But that's what the portfolio offers you is the ability to see where you are exactly right now in the change and your change overall. And at the same time, you can set alerts to track the position more handily to when you should. So when should I manage the short call? If you don't want to be assigned, Patrick, I'd set a stop that's within the 1% lower range than the strike price. So, for example, if I had sold the 70 call, I may actually, and I don't want to be assigned at all, I may actually set my stop limit at 69.30. So 1%, 70 cents below my strike price. If the stock moves from 68.50 up to 69.30 or 69.50, I may consider adjusting that short call or rolling it. I allow mine to go a little bit in the money, okay? Uh, because in, in this case, with this particular married put, if it did go up to above 7050 and I was assigned, I wouldn't mind. I, I'd have a reasonable return on the position, uh, I think about close to 70, uh, 7%, uh, 8% or so, if I did get assigned at 70, had I sold the 70 call today. Um, so that's okay to get assigned and then I just close the put. Uh, but I'm looking to do something different with this with the idea of earnings coming up in 10, 12 days, okay? Um, all right, so that's how I use it and that's what I look for my stops. I don't want it to go above my short call strike and in relation to rolling the put, if I go usually one or two points above the short put, maybe one point or a dollar fifty above, I'm sorry, the long put, the put that I bought, that's when I might look to roll it up to the other side. In general, if I first open a married put from Mondelez, if I see this gain go up to about three or four percent, I might consider selling the call or rolling the put up. If I see it drop by four percent or five percent, I may consider rolling the put down. And that's discussed in the blueprint as well in each of the income methods of when you would look to roll the position. Okay. All right, so I'm sorry, Isaac uh, had a question here. Oh, I'm sorry, Stanley was next. I apologize. Stanley uh, says, is there an idea delta range for selling covered calls? Okay, well, Stanley, this goes exactly back to what we were just talking about uh, with um, the idea of are you, do you, are you more conservative? Are you more moderate or are you more aggressive? What range are you looking for in your covered call positions? Okay, what do I mean by that? So, you're new to covered calls or you're looking to trade covered calls. And you know that you can pick a variety of strikes. I've had a lot of calls over the past few weeks of customers asking me, uh, they see the morning updates and price watch alerts that we send out and they say, why on earth would anyone sell an in the money covered call? You're not going to make a profit. Well, no, 
you could still make a profit, it's just not gonna be what you want. Depending. So let me do this. This one just came up naturally. It's a one month out, but it doesn't matter, Stanley, if we look one week out, two weeks out, three weeks out, or four weeks out. Here's Micron Technology. The stock's at 2732. We could sell the May 25 call for 264. All right, so this option is two dollars and thirty-two cents in the money. By selling the premium for two sixty-four, we're only going to make thirty-two cents of true profit or time value. So that's only a one point three percent return for a twenty-eight day trade. Now that might not be too bad, but that depends on what your goals are. What does this also offer? A nine point seven percent downside protection because I am collecting two sixty-four. My net debit is going to drop to 24.68. What does that mean? It means the stock can fall 9.7% or down to 24.68 before I'm technically losing money on the position at expiration. It's about a 10% downside. Okay. So now we're going to talk about well, what's the difference between the others? Okay. Well, let's figure that out. Let's look at it for May 1st, standard May expiration. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go more than, ah, that's 10%. No more than 10% in the money. I set that up wrong. No more than 10% out of the money for standard May expiration. But I'm going to use the search by symbol tool here in the search to just look at MU. Okay. Now, why do I want to do that? Did I just put in the wrong price? Isn't that Micron? Oh, okay, I see what I did. We'll just go less than 10 out. There we go. Now that should have worked. Okay, let me just do it this way. Meh, sorry folks. One is overwriting the other. I'm sorry, one is overwriting the other and that's not supposed to happen. Okay, hold on. Never mind, that wasn't the problem, I'm the problem. I meant to select May 28th, not May 2018. <laughs> All right guys, sorry about that. Someone, someone saw that and pointed it out to me. Okay, let's see here. All right. There we go. All right, so why am I doing it this way? Here's our 25 strike in the money. Here's the 30 strike out of the money. Okay, so standard of what you'd see on any option series. When you go in the money, you have a higher downside protection and a lower percent return if assigned. So the 25 the 26 strike offers a 7% downside and a 2.3% return if assigned. The 27, the at the money strike, sort of offers the closest to a one to one ratio. 4.6% downside, 3.6% if assigned. Okay, so it's the closest to the one to one ratio. Now, as we go out of the money, what happens? I'm getting a lower premium. So if I sold the 29 call, I'm only getting 50 cents. With a stock at 27.32, that means if I get assigned, I gain a dollar 64 or dollar 68 on the stock plus my 50 cents. I'll get two point two dollars and eighty cents roughly of return, or two dollars and ten cents, which will come out to an 8.1 percent return. But I'm only getting a 1.8 percent downside protection because I only receive 50 cents. And far out of the money at the 30, you're only taking in 30 cents, but that's $2.68 above. So you'd make almost $3 on the position if you were assigned. If the stock went up to 30 and you got assigned, you'd be at 11% return, but you'd only have a 1.1 downside protection. The in the money, 9.7 downside, 1.3% return is the opposite, of course, of the out of the money. So if you're looking to trade this to get assigned, this is what I'd call aggressive, this is what I'd call conservative in the money, 
and right here at closest to the one-to-one -one ratio is your moderate. Okay, I know that's not your question, but I have to point this out. Because you're asking me, <clears throat> what is the, uh, oh, sorry, just look at the follow-up question. Oh, okay, sorry, hold on one second here. Oh, man, okay. So, what you're asking me is, what is the best delta range to use when doing a covered call? I can't answer that. Why can't I answer that? Because I know there are investors who are successful trading in the money. The weekly picks of the day and the monthly picks of the day that Ernie put together and back tested the criteria that he put forward, these both look for in the money covered calls. Those resulted in the highest return on the entire portfolio over a one year period, uh, trading about 100 trades, than the out of the money and the at the money. Okay, because the ones that dropped, you didn't lose as much, and the ones that gained, you still made a profit. Okay, so statistically, I would say that the slightly in the money ones, the better. But I know covered call traders that are members of power options who are very successful going at or just slightly out of the money based on their stock criteria and their selection process. So what is the delta range? Well, it depends on what you want to do. If you're conservative and you want to be in this range, you're going to be looking for deltas of about 0.65 or higher on the call. If you want to be in sort of the moderate range here, sort of the at the money, you're looking from about 0.4 to 0.6. And if you want to go out of the money for higher aggressive trades with a higher potential return but a lower probability of getting it, you're looking at a delta of less than about 0.4. Okay, so it depends on what structure you want, what goals you want. Okay, so your goals for a, a, a 28-day trade here, because I went with the monthly, if your goal is to make 2.5% return if assigned, that's, that's your hope for your goal, Stanley. You're not looking at the in the money. You're focusing on the at or slightly out of the money. But hopefully you're probably not doing the deep out of the money because then you're not giving yourself any downside protection. So you're going to be in a delta here, again, of about 0.45 to 0.65. And of course, you don't believe me. Well, let's go to choose columns. Wait, do I already have it up? I'm sorry. I didn't see it here. It's hidden. Nope. So let's go ahead to choose columns. And I'm going to select delta, and let's change our column order here, because I want my delta to be right next to the downside protection and percent if assigned. So let's refresh our page, folks. All right, and there we go. So what did I say? Here's your deltas here, you know, 0.65 or higher with the in the money. 0.45 to 0.65 for the at the money, and less than 0.4 for the out of the money. 0.23 and 0.12 for those deep out of the money. And I guess we could consider the 28 a little bit out of the money as well. So the 0.58, that one-to-one -one ratio is right in the middle. Okay. So what's the best delta range? Well, don't worry about delta range in my opinion. Set your goals for what you want and set the search to what you want. So whether you're doing a seven-day trade, a 14-day trade, a 21-day trade, or standard monthly, what is your percent return goal for a 7-day, 14-day? You know, here it should be about maybe 1%. Here you should look for about 1.5 to maybe 2, maybe 2.5 in the high end. Here you're looking about maybe 2.5 or so. And then 28 days or the standard monthly, you should be looking at about 2.8 um, to about 3.5. That should be your return goal. I believe, but that has to match your goals. What is your goals for your annualized return trading this strategy? You can break that down to what your time frame is, and this is usually maybe less than 1%, 0 0.8, 0 0.7 to maybe 1.2, 1.3 on this end, on the seven-day trades. But that's what it comes down to. So is delta, is a delta range really important? Well, it depends on your goals. I personally think you should be in this range. I'm going to say about 0.4 to maybe 0.75 delta. Now that we've gone through all of that, I came up with a number for you. So that's going to focus you at in the money. If you want to be more conservative, you'll see some potential out of the monies, which might offer a higher return but lower downside protection, and you'll get closer to that one-to-one -one downside protection to percent of assigned ratio with the at the money series as well. 
You can go deep in the money if you want to be more conservative. I just don't know if the return is going to match your personal goals. I can't set your personal goals for you. Okay? All right. Let's take a look here now at Isaac's question. Isaac says he had a naked put 39 strike on AMAT. A-M-A-T. All right, so let's look at where AMAT is today. This was a naked put. Oh, oh, April 21st, the 39 strike. Okay, so the stock's at 39.79. But what he does say is that the stock was dropping rapidly last week. I decided to leg in and turn this into a bear put spread by buying the 40 put. The strategy backfired. Stock reversed in the last two days, and I ended up closing for a loss. Can you please discuss the problem? Okay, well, first, let's look at applied materials. And we started off with selling the 39 strike put. Sorry, hold on one second. I'm just going to look for something here. Okay, I don't have a premium for it. That's fine. Okay, so let's go to the custom spread tool. Oh, shoot. Uh, okay, sorry, folks. All right, so here's the last few weeks of AMAT. It was dropping randomly. It had gone down to about 37.50, and then we gapped up. Okay, now that's important to note on the 19th, it gapped up uh, for this discussion. Okay, so where am I going with this? Well, let's take a look. At, let's say that we had sold the AMAT naked put, uh, I don't know, uh, the 39 April put, I'm sorry, folks. Made a mistake here. There we go. Okay, that's much better. Let's say we sold it about 10, 12 days ago. And we would have gotten a premium uh, roughly, I don't know, say 55 cents. Okay, there we go. Okay. So, wow. That would help if I selected sell, huh? There we go. All right, so here's AMAT. Sold the naked put. Now, as we saw from the profit and loss chart, or the big charts here, it started to drop. And as it was dropping at 38, 37, and so forth, we decided to enter into a bear put debit spread. Not we. Uh, uh, Isaac here decided to add a bear put debit. And he went ahead and he bought the April 40 put. And he probably would have paid about, let's call it, two fifty now two thirty five. Okay, so when the stock was dropped down at thirty seven range, uh, you know, thirty eight range, he might have paid two thirty five with three days to go. So overall, what does this leave him with? Oh no, I don't want to go that high. I want to go I'm sorry folks, I want to go one forty. Okay. That's better. I, I thought it was a two point spread. It's a one point spread, my apologies. All right. So now we're in a bear put debit because the stock was falling it was down to about 37 or so, or close to it here. So we wanted to try to get this little return from the naked put by doing the bear put debit. So now if we have to buy at 39, guaranteed to get 40 back, so we'd have a $1 gain. We'd get $1 between the difference in strike prices, and we set it up so we had a small debit of 85 cents. So we might make a maximum of 15 cents where we would have had a loss on the naked put. Well, then what happened? Well, the stock went up to this point closed at 39.79, so now the 40 put expires worthless, and this is done well. So Isaac wants to know, what can I learn from this? I'm not sure exactly what the gap was there, but let's take a look at the stock research tool and power options very quickly. Okay, the next earnings are 5.18, so it wasn't related to earnings. Just like my AEIS position, AMAT jumped up quickly on that three-day period and was now, where my covered call was now in the money, his naked put would have been out of the money, but unfortunately he entered as a bear put debit spread. So, where did you go wrong? I, I can't say that you necessarily went wrong. You did a proper kind of protection for your position by buying the 40 strike put to convert this into a position because you thought the stock was going to stay down. As soon as you saw it reverse, and move back closer, even if it gapped up, I would have sold to close the 40 put immediately that you bought, 
and left this open. I know it's a gamble, but you've only got two days to expiration, and now it looks like the naked put is going to work for you. So you protected the downside in case it fell. That was your projection. I can't say you really did anything wrong. It's just the market didn't stay down for you, just like it didn't stay down for me on AIS. I wanted that call to expire worthless or buy back for 50 cents. I ended up paying 350. In this case, you saw it going down, and rather than taking a loss on the bull put, I'm sorry, the naked put to begin with, by creating the bear put, you would have turned that into a profit had it stayed at 38, 38, or 37.50 or 37. Okay, you would have had a winning position. But then it reversed, and it jumped suddenly. So on that sudden jump, I would have tried to get as much as I could have back for that 40 put, selling the close it, left this open, maybe. But then you're taking a gamble as well. Um, depending on what you originally received for your put, again, remember, I'm sorry, let me go this route. I can't promise you that it would have been any better monetarily. But remember what we talk about in our Managing Naked Put webinar. If I had sold the 39 puts some time ago, we're right on this line, and okay, there's our 39 strike, I probably would have closed the position here, maybe here, uh, maybe even here. Probably would have even closed it here. I look to close the put if the stock reaches within 1% of my short put strike price. So my trigger by having the 39 put open would have been if the stock fell to about 39.40. Again, I don't know when you open this. I don't know if it was two months ago, 30 days ago, or five days ago. But if the stock reaches within 1% of my short put, and remember on the naked put, I don't want the stock to drop below it. So here's the 39. So I might have set my trigger to roll at 39.40, about one within 1% 1 of that short put strike price. So I'd have looked to manage this position somewhere in these time frames before I had to panic here. Okay, so that's, I feel, the lesson to learn is that you did an approach where you got the stock was falling rapidly, so you entered in a bear put that would have been profitable, but then it recovered. And I'm saying that maybe before you get to this point where now you're looking at a dollar, dollar fifty, or almost two dollars in the money, or dollar forty in the money, you might have wanted to close it earlier or rolled it down to the 38 or the 37 strike further out in time prior to watching the snap here and be caught in that position where it can rebound on you. That is always a problem with the management, and it's a lot of the problems with the elaborate managements as well. I hear investors talking about adding a um, ratio call spread to repair a credit spread or an iron condor. Well, now you're giving yourself three ways to lose, okay? That sounds strange, but you might end up in the profit and loss chart that kind of almost, I've seen these before. I've seen bear call credit spreads be repaired by adding ratio call spreads to give you sort of this M profit and loss chart. So you can lose here, you can lose here, and you can lose here. What you're really hoping for is just here or here. I, that's such a gamble. And it's complicated now because you have almost five working legs on the position. That's tough. It's really tough as a management technique. So before you get to a position for what I like to call desperate management, because you're panicking now that you're going to take a big loss on the cash secured naked put, or if it was a credit spread, you converted the naked put into a bear put, which would have been successful, always weigh the risks to reward. Yes, your bear put debit would have been profitable if your stock stayed below 39. Okay, there we go. I put that in at 135. Oh, sorry, 140. So yes, it would have been profitable down there, but if there was a recovery, and if especially if it almost went above 40, was it worth it to take the loss? Now, you probably took a loss less than this, I'm hoping. Your loss was probably less than a dollar from the original uh, maximum return you were receiving from the short put. So I don't think this, you took a loss, but I don't think it was probably too bad of what it could have been had the stock stayed and continued down below 37, okay? And it wasn't the max loss on the bare put, but close to it. And these are just prices I invented. I don't know what you got for it. So. Uh, that that's kind of what I'm talking about there is that and do it before you feel you have to do the wow I'm sorry folks let's see here okay let's see I'm sorry I had to go uh, forward here let 
Okay. All right. Sorry, folks. I had to. I'm moving ahead in the questions to see if there's anything related to this particular topic. Okay. Uh, let's see. And where we just reviewed those other ones as well. Okay. Okay, and then Patrick, that's a different question I'll get to in a moment. And there we go. Oh, okay, and then there was Isaacs, okay? Good. So, okay. Where are we caught up? Are we caught? Up? Oh, no, there's there's this one that came in here, okay. Uh, this one's from David. Okay, sorry. Sam's question came in first. Going back to AEIS that we were looking on the chart, he says, why didn't you do a bull put spread on AEIS on a bounce on the 20 line BB from 64 to 66? Because this isn't a stock I'm trading in a strategy of a bull put credit spread. It's trading as a long-term married put and using different approach to it. Uh, Should have done it as a bear call spread. Should have bought the call back when it was at 65. But I don't do bull puts on this because that increases the risk to the downside if it would have fallen further below 65. Was it a guaranteed bounce? Absolutely not. Okay, I only do credit spreads on the broad-based indexes and ETFs. I don't do bull put credit spreads um, on the stocks I'm trading in the radioactive trading technique. The income method number six, the bear call is, but it's different. It's not a bearish spread. It's actually a bullish play on a stock. I might show an example of that depending on the time we have, which I don't think we're going to have time to do that. It's already 520. We still have about 10 questions to go through, so let's go. David's question. I've been practicing trading for a very short period, and I've been using the rollout opportunities from the analysis, okay, to see what adjustments were available for consideration. I made my first adjustment with income method number six, and the stock moved above the short call. I looked for help or advice now should be managed six, but the position analysis tab was not, okay. I says, believe me, I needed help on how to manage at six with no rollout offers being offered. I just closed the trade. How does one manage a six? Um, David, okay, so what is he talking about here? What David's talking about is something that I did a little bit yesterday in preparation of earnings. And I've got to go back to square one. Uh, let's see if I had 100 shares of stock at a cost basis of, my apologies, before my roll, this is at 236, this is at 33.63, is $1.80, $31.80. Okay. And let's go out to July, and I had the 34 put at the time, cost basis of 222. No, 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 that's, I'm sorry, one, one dollar off. No, not even one dollar. It's 32.20. This is closer to it. Hold on one second, folks, I'm sorry. It was. Uh, one last chance here. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> so, here's the married put I was standing on on eBay when the stock was trading at 34.20? 34.25, three days ago, two to three days ago. I had the 34 put, the stock was trading at about 34.25. And, of course, my cost basis was 35.02 into the position, and I was uh, standing here with this married put. Now, what I ended up doing is selling a bear call spread, an income method number six on the position that David's referring to. And I sold, I'm going to put it in here, the 35 call at the time for 96, and I bought the 37 for 28. 36, 93 and 36 were my premiums, okay? Okay. All right. And I have two I have two follow-up questions for you David when I David when I talk about this, okay? And I'll get to that in just a moment. All right. So here's what I had, it was an income method number six position. It lowered my risk down on the trade. I did something else too, and I'll explain that in a moment. So here's the income method number six. It's the bear call spread with a 35-37 strike on the position. Okay, And the idea behind it was it generated about a 57 cent net credit, which lowered my risk going into earnings, and it left the upside open. 
because sure, I've sold a 35 call, but I also have a 37. So my positive delta will increase. So even if it gapped up, put would lose money, but I'd still be gaining on the long call, even if I was assigned at 35. All right, that's income method number six. So uh, follow-up question for David. The first question is, is David, I can't look you up right now on my account um, uh, because it would it'd probably show to everyone. But if you're a Blueprint owner or a Fusion subscriber, okay, which I, I know you're one or the other. I just don't know which one off the top of my head. But when you log on to your account at Radioactive Trading as a Blueprint owner, you can check out things on uh, Blueprint owner-only webinars. And let's see here. I don't think this is the one I want. Um, it's discussed a little bit here in the five ways to manage income method number five as a blueprint owner, even though it's income method number six we're talking about. But also here in the members only Fusion subscribers one, there's also white papers you get the income method uh, cheat sheet uh, and so forth. And yeah, the five ways to milk your uh, RPM profit machine. And I'll send you another one, David. Um, sorry, I'm not seeing it exactly where it is. I know where it is. Uh, I know what it is, I should say. I'm just not finding it here. But there's ways to manage the income method number six position. Okay, but let's go back to where we are now. I'll send you the full video on that, managing income method number six, some of the discussion on that. Here's the idea. In other webinars I've done, I'm sorry, I know exactly what it was. <laughs> Back to radioactive trading, whether a Fusion member or a Blueprint owner. Um, oh, I guess it's in the Blueprint one. It should be in Fusion 2. I'll get that corrected. I'm sorry. How to make 2017 your best trading year ever, but what I want to show you is the 12 income methods in review. This is available to Blueprint owners. And the 12 different income methods, I not only discuss each one, but how to manage it. It's really long. I apologize for that. I should have split it up into three different ones. We're going to redo that one in three different sections uh, for blueprint owners. So the bullish ones, the neutral ones, and the bearish ones. And it'll include not only what to do, but how to manage them as well. Um, oh, a question came in. Can you describe, uh, because of time right now, uh, I, I don't remember where it was, but a, an attendee had asked a question. Can you describe rolling down the put? Oh, Ziggy. Yeah, Ziggy, if you're a blueprint owner here, you can you can go into this. It's income method number nine in your blueprint. You can look at it there, and as a blueprint owner, you can look at it in the 12 different income methods here. And remember, um, you'll also have it playing the bear side of the market. It might show you on rolling down the put as well. It's a way to generate uh, income there to lower the cost basis on your position. You can do it in a way as well that will also uh, lower the risk in certain situations. Um, if Mondelez dropped right now, I could actually roll down the puts uh, to a different strike and a different expiration and actually lower the total risk and lower my cost basis into the position um, as well. Uh, but that's income method number nine. I'm not going to have the chance to go through it today, but Ziggy, you'll be able to check that out in your blueprint under income method number nine or if you check the webinars here for uh, blueprint owners only and the 12 income methods, you'll see it there. All right. But to the question of six, whenever I use an income method number six, I've, I've said this in other webinars, I believe, um, and especially in that 12 income method uh, webinar, I always go two strikes apart on the bear call spread. Okay, why? It's to give me an extra management technique. I also discussed this in the power options webinar of doing bear call spreads by themselves, not in the context of a radioactive trade. All of my bear calls are bull pits bull puts are at least two strikes apart. Okay, why? Because one of the extra management techniques I'll use is if in this example, let's say the stock had moved up to close to 35, maybe around 34.80 or 34.90. Well, what I do is look to buy back the April 35 call and sell to open the April 36. So I just did one roll. I didn't close both legs of the position and roll out a whole nother month with, income, with a new bear call spread or another two weeks or anything like that. I'm just rolling one call up. So now I've got a bear call spread at the 36, 37, and then there as well. But I've given myself another dollar or so of protection without having to roll the entire spread. So what am I getting at with here? 
the concern on a bear call spread. Set up correctly, this is what you should see so you don't lose twice in this area. You never want to have an uh, income method number six in your married put where you dip back down and then come back up. You don't want to lose here, potentially lose here, and then really need a gain to go back up. You want to see something like this where everything is above the green. And that's really the only time you should use an income method number six. You shouldn't force it if it double dips down to a loss. That's not a good idea. Okay, so what is hurting the position as the stock moves up? Just as with income method number one, it's the short call. So, in reality, uh, I'm sorry, Donald, uh, David, in reality, treat income method number six exactly like income method number one. If the stock moves up and it goes above your short call strike, Look to apply income method number two, but again, I'd make sure that I'm two strikes apart with the income method number six. And if that isn't available, look to just buy back this call and roll out the call. Okay, here, here's another thing to, to think about. Here I am at April, and let's say two weeks ago, the stock broached up to 35. Now, I can't roll to the April 37, right? I can't roll to the 21st April 37 because I can't be long and short the same option at the same time in one account. But there's nothing wrong with if the stock went up to 35, 35, 50, maybe even 36 as you're saying, buying to close my 21st of April 35 call, leaving this open, why? Because well, if the trend is going this way against me, this 37 call is gaining money. But maybe I go out now to the 5th of May 37, it's a different expiration. I can be short that at the same strike, or maybe I go to a 38 now that the stock's trading at about 36. So now I've kind of got a bull call spread, but this one, my 37 call expires on 21st April is gaining value, and I'm hedging it with some higher strike premium going out in time again. Okay, so focus on the short call. Treat this short call of your income method number six like an income method number one, how would you roll an income method number one if this 37 wasn't there? Well, you might roll it up a strike, and then you'd be fine with a 36, 37. You might roll it up more than one strike, but further out in time. But if the trend of the stock's going up, you're okay leaving this 37 call open because it's just gaining in value for you. And then you can adjust this to the 05th of May or the 28th of April uh, 37 or 38 call, depending on what premium you receive for the buyback. And the most important thing, David, yes, as you mentioned in the portfolio, if you're tracking that particular position, a uh, bear call spread against a married put, the position analysis doesn't show up. But again, the ideas behind it are to treat the short call just like income method number one. Focus on what's causing you the loss first. It's not the put. It's not the stock. It's the short call. Okay? That's what, and even with income method number one, if the, you know, if I was in this position, but I just have sold the 35 call, in this case, and not bought the 37, if the stock had moved up to 36 or 35.50, what is my focus going to be on? What's losing me the most money? The short call that's going to a delta of one because I'm getting close to expiration. The put is the put plus the stock still has a positive delta. What's making me negative delta is the short call that generated me the premium. I have to focus on closing this first before looking to adjust the put or do anything else. That's what's hurting you is the short call, not the long call that's gaining in value is the stock in your favor as the stock moves up. Yes, the put's losing value, but that's countered by the higher delta in the stock. What's hurting you is the short call. Look to move that first. Even an in income method number six, treat that exactly as an income method number one. And whenever you get stuck in this situation again, as a blueprint owner uh, or as a Power Options subscriber, or even as a Power Options trial member, when you get stuck in a position where you don't know what to do, you send us an email, you schedule one of the coaching sessions as a trial member or a subscriber so you can talk with Ernie or myself and we can walk you through the ideas of managing the position that you're in. Can't give you direct advice, but walk through what you and I just walked through now, what could we roll to and what would it look like, that's what we would see during the coaching session. Or just call us during the office during market hours. Okay, Because you have access to that free support. So if you feel you're stuck in a position and the portfolio is not helping you with the knowledge that you need to maybe adjust it or get out of the position, that's when you schedule the session and that's when you uh, give us a call and schedule that as well. Okay? All right. 
Let's see here. Okay, what looks like a, one, a question from Patrick. Uh, let me go back to here. Okay, by rolling, okay, Patrick's next question. By rolling upward to follow the movement of the stock, don't you tend to be paying to get out of the old option and increasing your commissions? Especially in small to consider. Haven't typically followed call options upward with the stock pass, but okay. Okay, here's the issue. Okay, so what he's asking is why are you rolling the stock and why are you rolling the put to begin with? Okay, let me go back here. And let me find an option chain for eBay. Oh, sorry, eBay chain. And oh, I got to look at something real quick. I apologize. Um, let's see, uh, I'm sorry. Whoa, whoa. Okay, that just went weird. I apologize. I got to get some numbers here real quick on eBay. Okay, so this was originally, yeah, that was 222, 3243. Okay, that's what it was, 222 and, okay, 3243. Oh, yeah. I was on 34. Oh, sorry, folks. Yep, okay, okay. All right, so eBay position, this is what it looked like on 20th, or the 19th? Yeah, the 19th prior to the earnings the other day on April 20th, yesterday on April 20th, after market on the 19th. Uh, this was the position. Okay, so now I had originally bought the 34 put at 222 when the stock was trading at about 33, I think. But the other day, on the 19th, right before earnings, eBay had gone up in price to, let's see here, it was at 34.20. Okay, so when the stock was at 34.20, what I was able to do the other day and keep in mind, okay, cost basis of 34.65 entirely, risk of 1.9%. Now with the stock at 34.20 above my put strike, which is out to July, I'm going to roll this put. I rolled the put up first, income method number four. I was able to sell the 34 put at that time for 182. Okay, now what had happened? I lost, did I lose 40 cents on the put? Yes, I did. Ah, 0 0.40. On the original put, or the second put that I'd rolled to, I'm giving up 40 cents. But remember, I did this when the stock was at around 33.10, 33.05, and now the stock at this point was at 34.20. So I gained about $1.05 to only lose 40 cents on the put. The reason why that happened, of course, is the implied volatility across the board was increasing because we were right before earnings. So then what I decided to do is I closed that, but completing income method number four, I bought the 35 put at 236. Okay, so what am I doing here? Remember this 34.65 cost basis, the 222 is already included in that. So just taking this into account, by closing the 34 put and getting 182, and buying to open the 35 at 236, I'm increasing my debit by 54 cents. Okay, I'm adding to the debit. Am I paying a commission, Patrick? Yes, but remember, I'm only paying about one commission. I don't sell to close this and then buy to open. This is a roll. So they charge me the commission plus about an extra 40 cents when I do a roll. Okay, so it's just a little bit more than one standard commission to move up in price but I'm paying 54 cents. What am I getting out of it? A $1 higher guaranteed profit. Now pause for a moment. At the time, before I hit submit, remember we have a cost basis of 
stock plus put, and this includes all other adjustments I've made on eBay to this point. So my total into the position is 34.65. I said the stock was at 34.20 when I made this adjustment. And you already saw that I could sell to close this for 182. Okay, so at this point, the liquidation value was 36.02. So I have a profit of, let's just call it 36.05. So we have a profit of 140 on this position. Before I did the roll, I could have sold to close the stock at 34.20, sold to close the put, which I did at 182, which would have given me 36.05, 36.02. We'll call it 36.05. So a profit of 140 or 137, depending on how technical you want to get. All right, so that's where I was before I did this adjustment. Okay, now let's go ahead and erase all drawings. Now let's submit this. Okay, so now with that debit, my position goes up to 3519. My risk dropped down to about 0.5% on the, oh, Jesus. Wow, that was paused the entire time, wasn't it? Okay, so anyway, here's the position, I apologize. 3243 on the stock, 222 for the 34 put. We sold to close that at 182, and I bought the 35 for 236. So again, here's my original cost basis of 3465, stock plus put on the original position, just the original married put. The 222 is included in that 3465. Now, had I liquidated by selling the stock at 34.20 on the 19th and sold to close this at 182, right, that was our 36.02 liquidation. So right there, we're looking at a profit of 137. Right? That was the profit before I rolled up the put. But again, I rolled up the put, so I'm paying a debit here of 54 cents to gain one dollar higher payout. What did that do? Well down here we can see it dropped the risk down to 0.5 percent, 19 dollars. Okay so what's the big deal? Have I really lost anything on the position? Well remember I could have liquidated before rolling the put for 36.07. Now that I've rolled up the put what can I do? Well, I could immediately liquidate the position, couldn't I? I could sell to close the stock at 34.20. And this put didn't go to zero. So let's say I can get 234 for it. I could sell to close the 35 put I just bought for 234. So this puts me at a liquidation of 36.54. Okay? But remember, here's my profit that I had before I did the adjustment with a cost basis of 34.65 a value of 137, right? That would have been my liquidation profit before the roll. After I did the roll, my cost basis is 35.19. And I could turn around and sell the stock, sell the put for a little slippage and bid ask, get 36.54, so my profit is 135 if I liquidated. After the roll, now that I stand here even with a cost basis, I don't give up much profit. Okay, where I had a profit before is equal to where I have a profit after. I've just reduced the risk in case the stock collapses. So it's sort of like a split, money in versus money out. The profit I had on the position before I did the roll is almost equal to the profit I did after the roll. Now, that's based on following the rules of getting as close to you can of a one to two ratio for debit to increase in strike. Or what I call, I don't want to pay a debit that's more than 60% or 55% really uh, of what I'm getting back, right? So this ratio of difference in strike prices, which is $1, divided by my net debit, you know, I want that to be in the 55, 54% or lower range, right? And that's what happens. So what did I lose by rolling up the put? Profit-wise, nothing monetarily. Percentage-wise, yeah, it changed because I increased my cost basis, but I've also gained this reduction in risk to almost a bulletproof position, okay? So that's why I rolled upwards. Now, was it different with rolling the call on AEIS from earlier? Yes, but I want to stay in the stock. 
that's why I bought back the 65 call in AEIS because I want to stay in this married put position through earnings. I also want to reposition the married put I'm in to be able to profit in both directions before earnings using an income method number 12, which by the way is what I did on eBay <laughs> to complicate things. Now that I'm in this position here with a lower risk, what I ended up doing is the 5th of May, we already looked at this, 35, 37, bear call spread, where I sold this for 93, and I bought this one for 36, for the 54 cent, 57 cent net credit. Okay, now technically I'm in a bulletproof position, where I still have unlimited upside, so at earnings, when the stock was at 34, if it gapped up to 38 or 39, I still had unlimited upside. And now if the stock fell, well, I'd be giving something back, but I did have a bulletproof position. But now to even complicate things more, we did what we call the alternative to income method number 12. I took this 57 cent premium and I bought a fifth of May, 32 puts at 45 cents. Okay, so this was my position now. But what I was really focusing on is this here. The profit and loss sort of at the halfway point. Now, it's at the lower end of where I am. Let's see, eBay dropped from 3420 down to about 3260 on the first day, and it dropped another 50 cents today. So going into next week, if eBay continues down, why haven't I closed my May 5th extra 32 put yet or closed this bear call spread? Well, right now, the bear call spread's going to zero. I'm going to let that expire worthless. My 35 put has guaranteed me a reasonable profit that I can still get out. And I'm holding this close in 32 put, which is essentially right at break even. I could liquidate it now for 43 or 44 cents, but if eBay continues down because it had poor guidance or if the market's weak next week, after we've seen this three-day run-up, which Sam points out was uh, part of the tax discussion and everything from the current administration, but if this continues down, I'll be receiving more profits higher than what my liquidation value could have been the other day. But rolling up with the put didn't cost me anything monetarily as far as what I had with the gain before I did the income method number four and after as well. Okay. Oh, Sam points out, back. I'm sorry, back to a discussion on the covered calls and maybe even the bear call spread that's at the money. Sam says he's been selling covered calls in apples at 144 and 146 using weeklies and hasn't been caught out of the stock yet. Okay, just be careful, though, because the, uh, the earnings, I think, are coming up soon, so you don't want to get stuck with that depending on what it's going to be. I know you're going to reposition it, okay? I don't, Sam asked a question related to what I've been struggling with as well. Uh, Sam asked, how can one find how far the stock will drop on a sell-off? Uh, for example, OCN dropped from 8 to $2 and then bounced 11% at one time in the morning. Those type of low-price stocks, dry ships is another one. Uh, even though um, dry ships uh, has had two reverse splits, three reverse splits I think in the last three months, as I've been following the stock, I'll tell you why the reason I follow the stock to begin with in a moment. Uh, let me go back home. Uh, dry ships here is at 155 now, and of course many of you have probably seen this before. This is the stock that somehow, by miracles, end was up, jeez, you know, was way up high in the 80, 90 dollar range. Let's go back six months. It, it's so hard for any charting to keep up with this because of all the various reverse splits and things of that nature. This is when I think the stock kind of gapped up um, up to around, what was it, the $65, $70 range from when it had been trading at two, three, four, five dollars $5. Then it came back down, and it has little bumps. You know, let's go to one month now. It might look, I'll probably even go two weeks, and we could see it. Um, okay, this, this came up because a customer had asked me, I should go to two months. Sorry, folks, let me go to two months. A customer asked me the other day, well, how can I read post-split and pre-split data to see if it's going to go down or if it's going to go up? And someone who had tried to follow dry ships along this span, I mean, it looks easy to say, hey, it's lower left to right. But playing these types of lower price stocks, you would have gotten killed. Here's why. You play a reverse split for the downside, 
and it goes down to four, or it was right around here, and it goes down to four, okay? But then suddenly it bounces up to six. That's a 50% loss. You would have closed out here, and then you would have said, oh, well, maybe the trend's reversing on a buy, and then it goes back down to four, and then it comes back up, and then it gaps back down. See, these moves here are only dollar or two dollar losses, so I know, Sam, you practice position sizing. You don't invest too much, but a lot of people I talk to are trying to play these dollar price stocks. They don't want to buy, and I can't blame them, but they don't want to buy 100 shares of a $70 stock, but they don't practice proper position sizing. So what do they do? They buy 10,000 shares of a $7 stock. I, I just, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, if the stock drops two points, you're looking at about a 20% loss. You know, I, I mean, it's, and these are the kind of movements you see. This thing's bouncing all over the place here. And it's any little news that comes out. It, it jumps up, jumps down. You're hitting trigger points here, hitting trigger points on your stops. You're getting stopped out and moved out all over the place. I've tried to look at things, Sam, uh, open interest ratios, uh, volume, put option ratios. I had a coaching session with a customer the other day. Um, we were trying to look at uh, the, oh, geez, any differences in the put call volume ratio and put call open interest ratio um, before the earnings and after the earnings to depict whether it was going to be a bearish signal before the earnings and whether it was going to be a bullish signal after the earnings. If there was a drop, would the put call ratio change a certain way, which would indicate it was going to bounce back up or bounce back down? It was one of the hardest sessions I've ever had because it was so much data and, you know, this is one of those things that if you have a question like that, I can answer for you, but you almost need to give me the weekend to do historical data on. I can't do it in a 30-minute session, look at 10 different stocks and try to compare all the different ratios that happened pre and post split and pre or post earnings going forward and everything. It was, it was a hard coaching session for me because I was trying to scramble to get as much data as I could on the stocks that he was telling me. Um, in any case, what's the long and short of it? The 10 stocks he gave me were 50-50. Some of them had a put call ratio below one before earnings, and some had a put call ratio below one or above one. Those that were above one, 50% of them moved up from earnings, 50% moved down. Those that were below, 50% moved up and 50% moved down. The options data didn't really tell us anything. And that's what I was afraid I was going to find out. Um, but in any case, you know, that's, that's sort of the scenario there. Um, as well. Uh, Isaac, uh, another question came in. Oh, let me see. Sam here just mentioned that you got lucky on Dreis's. When Dreis was at 40, you did buy in and you got out at 90. That <laughs> was just, yeah, it was a two day, two hour trade, day trade in a few hours. Yeah, that was ridiculous. Good for you. I remember we had talked about that, Sam, when that happened. That's right. I was scared to touch it. Um, Dry ships uh, was actually one of my biggest success stories, very close to that back in the heyday of the bulk shippers. I got in the uh, dry ships at I think 55 or $56 per share, wrote it up to 80 or 82 and then closed out of it. Not doing covered calls, not even doing married puts. I just owned the stock. It went up. Why didn't I do covered calls? Because I couldn't catch it. It's moving up so quickly. Now, this is years ago in the heyday of the bulk carriers. So I closed out at 80, 82 I think. So I had a really good profit on that position. And then I watched it, just, I figured it couldn't go any higher. And then it went to 90, it went to 95, it went to 98. And this is in a two to three week span. It goes up to 115, I think, or 112. And people start asking me, oh, should I buy back into dry ships? I see it's been lower left to upper right is the perfect. I said, oh, I'm not touching this one with a 10 foot pole. This thing has a better chance of dropping back to 60 in two weeks than it has to go up to 120, you know? And that's exactly what it did. It dropped back down to 60 and then it kept falling and falling and falling. And then it was down before I knew it. I wasn't paying attention, but a year and a half later, it was at $5 per share. So uh, that was this one here. But that's why I, I track it when I see these news, because it's a good example of what and what not to do. Ah, okay. Let's see here. Isaac, this is something that we're going to discuss next week or the week after. I'm sorry, Isaac. I, I, I'm going in my mind what my schedule is for next week with uh, videos that I'm doing. Um, that we're putting together as standalone videos plus other live webinars. So maybe not next week, but the week after that, you'll see something on this. Isaac asked, do you believe the strategy of buying ATM straddles for high volatility stocks five to 10 days before earnings? Strategy tries to capture the increase in option premiums, the implied volatility increases toward earnings. No, I do not, okay? Because I don't think five to 10 days is 
close enough. I, I know there's someone out there who's teaching this. I know that they have are showing success to the people they're advertising it to and that they're teaching it to. Uh, okay, there's there's two people out there. I think Tasty Trade slash uh, uh, Tom Sosnoff from former Think and Swim, I think he talks about this on the Tasty Trade TV show or blog or uh, video blog, whatever you want to call that little show he does. It's the Tasty Trade show. Don't get me wrong. I love Tom. I think he's a great guy. He's a great educator. He's very knowledgeable about options. I'm not saying anything against him. Uh, he, he talks about this. I know there's another service out there that teaches this for a price. Uh, not only the education of how to do it, but you can follow their picks as well. Not related, not related to Tasty Trader Tom Sosnoff. Um, I'm going to say I don't agree with it because I don't think it's enough time. Okay. Why do I say that? I think five to ten days before earnings, the volatility is mostly already priced in. You need to go about three weeks or four weeks before the earnings to buy an at-the-money straddle to get benefit of the increased implied volatility. Do all stocks run up in price before the earnings? No. eBay actually dropped. AEI, uh, not AEIS, I'm sorry. One of the other positions I was in uh, actually moved up as well before earnings. Not every stock does that. Okay, let me show you an example. Short-term earnings straddles. By the way, we're looking at uh, some of my actual accounts here. These were smaller positions. Oh, i got to go to analysis here. Okay. All right. So what I was doing here is exactly what you're saying, but I wasn't planning on the volatility as an increase in price. What I was doing is strictly an earnings play on stocks that I felt would move at least 7 to 8% or more based on their move. First one I opened was for 17th of March expiration. I opened it on March 16th for Adobe. I bought the 125. This is a strangle. Sometimes I do the straddle. You'll see or the straddle. You'll see that on MU and Nike. Oh no, uh, Perigo, Nike, and MU. I did uh, Adobe. I did not. I did a strangle on that. Okay. Uh, so on March 16th, I bought it. I probably bought into increased volatility but it was already priced in you know, 20 days before that. And I closed it out on 317 after earnings. Uh, it's about a 63.7% gain. I'm not looking for 200, 300% gains here. I'm looking for 50 or higher and then just taking the premium and running. Okay, so where am I going with this? Let's go to Adobe on March 16th. Earnings came out, close of business on 316. So I'm doing a one-day straddle with earnings coming up. Some of these are, here's 322, and I closed it on 324 when earnings came out. So two days and two days. This one was longer because it was confusing on uh, PRGO. It wasn't really clear when the earnings were coming out. All right, so what do we want to do? We want to go to a chain on Adobe. Oh, I'm going to do it over here. I'm sorry, ADBE. And we are going to go to March 16th. Sorry about that. And for our March 17th expiration, there we go. Now at this time, I've got to add it in, don't I? Yeah, let me add it into both real quick. I apologize there. IV, IV. Okay, so at this time, remember I did the, what did I do, the 120 call? I'm oh, sorry, the 120 put, 125 call. So 125 call is at 0.85. We'll call that the volatility going in the day before earnings at 0.85. And the 120 put, 0.88. Okay. Now, how about taking it back five days? Let's go to, okay, and let me write this down. Okay, so the 125 call is at 0.85. 120 put is at 0.88. Premium of one. I'm sorry, folks. Uh, 112 for the call. Premium of uh, 125 for the put. Using these prices, okay. Now let's say I stuck with the same one. So the cost, the debit to enter the position here would have been at 237. Now what I'm going to do. Go back to March 11th. Why March? Okay, March 10th. Why? Five days earlier than March 16th when I bought it. 
125 call is at 0.36. Okay, so in this case, Adobe, bigger strike, higher market cap, and 0.37, you've got a valid point. These ones here, five days before I got in, six to ten days before earnings coming out on three, um, 17, so seven, seven, eight days beforehand, the volatility is at 0.3, okay? But is that really giving me what I want? Okay, now let me, let me explain why. Stock's at 121.09 on March 10th. Volatility is low. The 125 is only at 36 cents. The one, I'm sorry, 36%. <laughs> and the 120 put is at 37. Cost of the 120 is $2. And the cost of the 125, 92 to 104, so it's a 12 cents. So let's call it 98 cents. The price to enter this strangle with the implied volatility at 0.37 with the stock at 121 is 298. Do you see that? It's 298. The price I got in the day before was 237, even with the implied volatility is at 0.85. Okay, so here, you know, it's a seven days remaining to expiration, of course. That's why it was so close to expiration. But even with the increase in implied volatility, you paid more with the lower implied volatility to get in the position than I did the day before at 237. Okay, so let's take your example, though. Let, let's do it at the money straddle with these numbers. 295 to 310, let's be nice. 120 call at $3 with an implied volatility of 0.37. Ah, two dollars. Why not? I know it's not, but let's let's call it two dollars here uh, for the one ninety. So let's just call it about five dollars. Let's give a little back. Let's call it four ninety cost basis for the one twenty straddle. Seven days before earnings and expiration, with an implied volatility of 0.37. Okay, we've got a cost basis again of four ninety. Okay, now. Real quick, what happens next? Next day, the 11th, stocks around the same price, 340 to 350. Look, the volatility went up to, from 0.37 to 0.49. And we've got a 350 premium on our call, so it's up 50 cents. But the 120 put, which also jumped up in implied volatility to 0.48, drops down to 165. So right now, We've got a premium of 515. You've got a 20 cent profit. Yeah, 515. A 25 cent profit on day one off of a 490 investment with the increase in volatility. 71 cent change in the stock. Next day, 0.54. It's going up. But your 120 calls at 310. Let's call it 320. I'm being generous here on the bid ask. And this premium here is about 175. So now you're back to a profit or a value, a liquidation value of 495. Three days in, two days in, the implied volatility has gone up from an average of 0.35 to 0.55. Your original debit to get into this spread was 490. Your liquidation on the third day is 495. So with an increase of 20% in implied volatility, you've made five cents. Okay, let's move forward again. And I think now we're getting into that range where I almost got in the position. We're on the 15th, the day before. 120 call, 63% implied volatility. Okay, so the 120 call, the stock's bouncing around here. It's at 122 now. So we're at 335, 360. All right. So we'll call that 350 again. And be generous, 135. Okay. So now you're at a cost basis of 485. Your volatilities are at 63%. From when they're 63%, you're at a loss. Next day. Here's where we were, 350 to 375. So let's go ahead and call that 365 on the call. 125 there for the put. So that's $4.90. Same price you paid five days ago. The implied volatility is more than doubled. Okay, but this is where I sort of got into the position, right? 
Um, I mean, even if you did the strangle I did, you would have paid, what did we say? Um, I'm sorry, not the strangle, but if you had done the other price, you would, yeah, you would have gotten in at 298 the day before, where I got in at a price of about 235 Okay, and then we go into the next day on the 17th. Now, what happens here? So you had to hold it through, and the volatility goes back to 0.56, right? Well, here we are. You've got a, let's call it $7 for this and $0 for this. So you made a profit of 110 but you only would have made a profit of nothing had you held it, even though the implied volatility more than doubled over that five-day period. Okay, so something's not adding up there, is it? It doesn't sound right, but you see this from time to time. It's not always a guarantee that when you double the implied volatility, you're going to get an increase going into earnings. I'd rather hold the position through earnings on a stock that I've seen what has happened the past few earnings, and I'm expecting an eight, seven to eight percent movement on the position. Again, so if you got into this position with your cost of 490 five days before your straddle, you're at the money straddle five days before when your implied volatility is a 0.37, and the day before it doubled to 0.85, remember that you had a loss. You had not made any money unless you close it the very day after for what did I say, 15 cents, 20 cents premium on a five dollar investment or four ninety investment? Eh. Okay. It's, I guess you could call that a reasonable return. But again, you hold it through earnings and we call this seven. Oh, I'm sorry, you would have made two ten. I did the math wrong. After the earnings on a four ninety investment. That's a good sixty three, seventy percent return, right? And what did I see on Adobe, even though I got in the day before when implied volatility was at its highest? From my cost basis, 160 or 63.7%. So I'd rather play the earnings through the earnings than try to play the implied volatility run up to it. Because this is one example here. I could run through the others, but naturally we're, we're uh, over time at 6.07 p.m. Eastern time. So this is why I am not a fan of trying to do an at-the-money straddle or even a strangle well before earnings to try to get the implied volatility ramp up beforehand and then close it out before the announcement. I'd rather play an earnings play where I make a profit on the position because of the movement and I got it at a lower price, okay? All right. Yeah, Sam says the market maker is out to get you there. Agreed, I mean, it's, it's interesting how the implied volatility doubled but we didn't see the increase in price and probably because it was so close to expiration. You know, there's still only so much he could raise the prices on it out there but the implied volatility factor was increasing due to the movement. And then after the movement, it sort of settled back down to the norm, and there was volatility crush. You saw the put go to zero, and the call gained its intrinsic value, and that's what you expected. Okay. So again, I mean, I can't argue the fact that that at-the-money straddle we were looking at, if I'd have bought the 120 straddle on March 10th, we saw a profit of 210 from an investment of 490. Of course, my investment here was... 251 and we took in a profit of 160 off of the 251 investment and you would have made 210 off of 490 only if you held it through earnings you would have lost had you tried to play the implied volatility game on this particular situation okay now I might go back and do the other ones as an analysis later on for you um, but this is why I don't play that implied volatility game leading up to earnings some positions will increase it's not guaranteed and if it's only a 50-50 win, the increase you're getting might not be a balance enough to wipe out the losses. Okay, so that's what you've got to take into account as well. Normally, we see it being factored in two to three weeks beforehand, well before the five to ten days you mentioned. Okay, I'll see what I can do when I get some spare time in the next couple of weeks there, see if I can do further analysis on these. So, yeah, these are some of the short-term straddles I've been playing. I've actually traded these. These were traded into my account. Like I said, the PRGO one was an aberration because everything I looked at said it was having earnings on a certain day, and then they postponed it. But unfortunately, they postponed it after 4-4 when I bought it on 322, and it <laughs> got all messy. I think it, this would have been profitable had I stayed it, been able to stay in the position for another week. I think it would have dropped further, but I only lost 38 cents on it. It was 11%. <clears throat> There's two other trades that I haven't closed out yet. Um, in my portfolio, both were uh, 62 and 61 percent gains uh, with this long straddle approach, but I'm holding them through the earnings, not ahead of time. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for joining me this afternoon, our Friday afternoon. Have a great weekend. Sit back, relax, soak in some of the stuff we talked about. I did record today's presentation. It'll likely be posted this weekend or first thing Monday morning, and I'll let you know when that's available in the requested topics section of our webinars page. Remember, it's poweropt.com slash webinars.asp. Ladies and gentlemen, take care. We'll see you soon. Good night.